Um, welcome to welcome to my talk about representation theory. And today I'm going to talk you uh, talk about representation theory and some applications in quantum mechanics. And uh, um, so basically, my talk will be um, about first of all the group representations and its applications in quantum mechanics. And if we have time, we can delve into a second part. It's going to be a little bit deeper. Deeper. Um, it's a um, semester project I I've been working on. I still haven't finished yet, actually. And um, about the unification of spin and wire representation, and it's also part of my bachelor thesis as well. Okay. So first of all, why group representation theory? And um, for those of you uh, who know quantum mechanics or study uh, physics three, for example, ATTH, know that all quantum physicists live in a Hebrew space. This means that we have a Hebrew space, a vector space e equipped with uh, a scalar product. And uh, just imagine those quantum physicists like quantum particles dancing around in this Hebrew space and they somehow try to, you know, dance, I don't know, and uh, to dance and eat transformations. And the quantum state, a quantum physical state phi in the Hebrew space, mm, we post postulate that the probability of finding it to be in another state p should be uh, the modulo of um, the scalar product, the inner product square. And uh, so now just imagine we have those, all those kind of particles dancing around in, in the Hebrew space. We, we call them physicists. And, uh, and we would expect, how would they dance? First of all, they have to dance linearly, right? Because they live in a linear vector space. So uh, the transformation of, um, of a physicist has to be linear. And uh, that's not only because, uh, you know, the physicists, they don't care about second order terms. And also the second expectation we would have is the movement, the transformations, they should form a group. And why is that? Because just, we can just go through um, the axiom of groups. For the first axiom is we we always have uh, the neutral element, which means um, we want the state to stay the same. So staying same should be part of transformation as well. And the associativity, which means that if we uh, transform once and twice, it should be the same if we just transform one, two together. And uh, the third axiom of a group is the inverse element. So basically we expect that if a physical state transform um, forward, it should be the same. Uh, we, we should expect uh, its ability to transform backwards. So that's the three group axiom we can check. So motivated by this transformation of physicists, we can define naturally uh, the representation of a group. So what's a representation of a group? It's, um, it's a group homomorphism from the group to the general, general linear group of uh, vector space. So basically we can just imagine if uh, this vector space is somehow finite dimensional, then we just map a group element to a matrix. And there are certain things I would like to uh, just mention for the representation. First, the first property is um, we call a representation irreducible if there exists no non-trivial G invariant subspace, which means, um, so basically for every element in G, we have this somehow matrix stuff, linear transformation. And uh, all linear transformation has its own invariant subspace. And we call the whole representation is irreducible, the, the vector space rho and V0. If all of these matrices defined by the action of this representation is invariant, um, acting invariantly on, on, on V0. And the very famous theorem tells us if we have a finite dimensional representations of um, a finite or a com compact group, um, we should expect the representation is completely reducible, which means that the vector space V, the representation space, can be decomposed into vector space which are irreducible. 
with certain multiplicity. And that, that is denoted by uh, this power over here, the tensor power, and we, which we can just understand as tensor with, uh, with c to the power of k1. And why do we call this multiplicity? multiplicity? It's because if we just take, uh, just, just observe the dimension of this space over here, like one single term, if we fix i, what's, what's the dimension? The dimension would be the dimension of vi times, because that's a tensor product, the dimension of c k1. So basically the dimension of this term would be k1 times vi. And that's why we call it multiplicity. So with this formula and the definition of irreducibility, um, it's kind of natural to think, uh, how can we classify all irreducible representations? Because as long as we have that, we have everything, right? So um, we can just take one re um, representation and it's always a sum of irreducible representations we already classified. So first of all, I would like to show you guys an example, um, a rather simple example about uh, uh, the symmetric group S3 consists of six elements. And uh, going back to this defin definition, we would like to send the group into uh, the general linear group. So basically we want to define an action and single each of that element in S3. And one of the most, let's say trivial action we can think about is actually, we can just send them all to one. So basically the first um, representation is a one dimensional space uh, C and we just send every um, element to one. And uh, actually you should imagine this one to be one by one matrix. So, uh, metric. so basically that's a left multiplication with one. And a second uh, representation, which is easy to, uh, to think of is the sign representation. So basically you can just uh, take the sign of G. If G is for example, one to two, then sign of G is gonna be minus one. So um, the action would be the left multiplication with minus one. And one, two, three would be mapped to one, for example, because the sign of one, two, three is one. And that's definitely different from the first one. And now we are kind of running out of ideas because the group looked like this and how can we define somehow a natural action so that the homomorphism property can hold. And there's actually um, a very magical formula about, um, about uh, group representations. It says all the irreducible representations, if we take the dimension of the space squared and sum over it, it should be the cardinality of G. So that's a very non-trivial fact that we have to show, but I will just um, tell you guys as a fact. And uh, if we use this formula and we have G is, the cardinality of G is six, right? We have S3 and the first two dimensions the first two vector spaces have each dimension one. So what left is actually a uh, number four. And we can just imagine how can we decompose number four into square terms? So it's either gonna be four is equal to one plus one plus one plus one, or four is equal to two squared. And there are actually, uh, um, if we really want to decompose into four different one dimensional um, sub-representation is not gonna happen because we already have the trivial one and the sign one. And there's no other way to define four different, another four different one dimensional one. You can check it by yourself. If you uh, just try to write those numbers in terms of minus and plus one. Um, that's not gonna happen. So the only possibility is we have a two dimensional, uh, two -dimensional uh, representation. And this is given by the, permutation of the vector e1, e2, minus e2, and e2 minus e3. And this seems a little bit, you know, hocus pocus, why, why should we do that, right? Um, it's actually kind of obvious if you take the, take the element one, two first. We know that we have this group homomorphism property, right? So if we take one, two, one, two square is gonna be identity because that's just a two cycle. So that the representation of one, two in this two dimensional vector space as a two by two matrix has to 
P, um, so basically the metric corresponding to one, two squared should be identity. And, uh, and since we're living C, we can just actually just assume that uh, we have this uh, Jordan normal form. So basically we take lambda one, lambda two and one, and then square it to identity and solve for lambda one and lambda two. So basically we can see how one, two looks like. And if, as long as we know how one, two looks like, we can somehow deduce how two, three should be looking like, look like and um, how one three should look like because they all kind of um, has a semi uh, symmetry uh, property um, and things all other cycles are actually generated by the two cycles we already have one two three and one three two and if we look at this representation um, I already kind of cheated by uh, marking out the by highlighting the color of the two cycle and three cycles. And we see that the trace of the red one is always zero and the trace of the blue one is always minus one. And why is that? The reason for that is because the red part is in the same conjugacy class and the blue one are in the same conjugacy class as well. And that's easy to see, to see because in SN, all, all elements in the same conjugacy class have the same lens. So basically we have this uh, lens two cycles, they are always in the same conjugacy class and lens three cycles are always in the same conjugacy class. And the reason why they have the same trace follows simply from the fact that first of all, we can, um, Suppose we have a, a trace, we want to compute the trace from tau and uh, take the trace of um, its um, conjugate, say sigma tau sigma minus one. And then since, since rho is actually a homomorphism, we can just decompose them into three terms and use the fact that trace is cyclic and permute uh, rho sigma to the other side. And then this gives us identity and in the end, we have that in the same conjugacy class, we have the same trace. And this amazing fact about trace actually motivates our next example about character table. And this is a very important tool we can use in, in representation theory. What we do in this character table is we label all the conjugacy class. So the identity element is always gonna be in its own conjugacy class and one, two has the size of conjugacy class of one, two is three, and the other one is two. And we just label all the irreducible representation one, two, three, we find into the table by just registering the, the trace. So it's, it's, uh, it looks like, uh, like, a, like a black magic we're doing. So why are we looking at trace and, and um, what it's giving us about the information of the group S3? But there are actually um, a lot of um, like fun facts about this character table. Mm -hmm. First fun fact is, is that we have the column also normality. So basically if we take a look at the two columns, I highlighted the first and second one. And if we just view them as a vector one, one, two over here and take the inner product with itself, it's gonna give us one plus one plus four is gonna be six. And if we, if we divide it by the cardinality of the group, six, it's going to give us one. And same applies for um, the red column and the third column as well. And what's also worth to notice is that if we take this two vector here and take the uh, scalar product, it's going to be one minus one plus zero. So that's the zero. That basically means the column is also, also normal to each other. And apart from that, we also have the fact that the row is the rows here the first row, second row, and the third row, they are also, also, also normal to, to each other, but in a weighted way. So basically what we do is if we take the first row and the second row and take the scalar product weighted with the size of conjugacy class, we get zero. We can compute, for example, we have one. Here we have minus one times three. So we got one minus three plus two, and that gives us zero. And we can do the same verification for other rows and also one row with itself, it's gonna give us one. 
So if you would take, for example, one plus three plus two, it's gonna give us six and divided by the cardinality of S3, it's gonna give us one as well. So we note that the row is also normal to each other as well. And what does it kind of help us? So now we go back to our first goal. So basically we had this um, um, decomposition of finite dimensional representations. We want to decompose them into reducible representations. And trace gives us exactly this information that we would have if we have a representation that we try to de decompose. What I'm trying to say is since these three vectors over here, they build an orthonormal basis of the whole character table, of course. And every representation is gonna be the sum of these three representations. And what we do is just, we, we say that, okay, uh, we take an arbitrary representation and say it, it, it is, it's the sum of um, like say lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, with the three representation we already know. And to compute lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, we just need to take the scalar product we just showed over here with the character table here, each rows and uh, then we get the decomposition. Yeah, it's kind of ab abstract to this point, but I, I'm gonna show you guys the example later, how to use that in concrete. Um, but also a very interesting fact, while I was taking the course group representation theory, um, I was like talking to uh, this uh, student in chemistry at, uh, at the party, that's, that's what you do, right? At ETH party, you just talk to random people and uh, and somehow you bring up character table. And turns out for chemistry students, they have to memorize the whole character table. And for them, it's not obvious why the, those numbers come from. And the, the reason why is that they, re, they use the character table to describe actually the group symmetry of some certain molecule. So instead of, instead of writing S3, they would write some uh, molecule over here. and. Uh, and I also dig up a little bit information about how do they use that and how, how to achieve a physical result for them. And uh, I will show you guys example later. And before doing that, I have to mention some important theorem about group representation theory so that we can compute later. And the most important theorem, in my opinion, in group representation theorem is actually called a lemma, unfortunately. It's, it's called Schur's lemma. So Schroes lemma states that if we have two irreducible representation and another map F between the two vector spaces um, and they intertwine with each other. So basically if we, um, if we have the map F, it goes from V to W. So if we do the F first and the representation of um, W, it should, um, the property is saying that it's going to be the same if we do the representation of V first and then F, and this should hold, hold for every element G. And the consequence of uh, this map is that this map is either zero or isomorphism. It's a very, um, let's say, a very strong uh, consequence of this, uh, this intertwining property. And the proof is actually quite simple. It's just one line because uh, the kernel of F and the image of F, they are both invariant subspaces of um, the representation W and uh, V. That's easy to check if you take the kernel element out of uh, V and use this map and then use the intertwining property and it should uh, give you the result that it's invariant under the action of um, the representation of V. And since we assume that these two representation are actually irreducible, then the kernel and the image F should be trivial, saying that it should be either zero or the whole thing. So if the kernel is the whole thing, then F is zero. If kernel is trivial and the image is the whole thing, then F is an isomorphism. So that's the Schroes lemma, which is very powerful. And uh, as a very strong corollary uh, that physics, physicists use all the time is that if we just take V and W to be the same vector space 
and take it to be over complex numbers. And the reason for that I will explain later. Um, and um, if we have F which intertwine with uh, the single representation we provided here, the N, then F has to be lambda times identity. And that's actually a very simple consequence of Schroer's lemma as well. The proof for that, it's also just one single line because if we take F, so because we live in, in the complex number C, so F has definitely an, an eigenvalue and we can call it lambda. And if we observe the, the, observe the, the term F minus lambda identity, it shows that F minus lambda identity intertwines with the representation because F intertwines with the representation, that's just assumption. And the identity mapping intertwines with, um, with the representation trivially as well. So F minus lambda identity is equal to zero or it's an isomorphism. But F minus lambda identity is never an isomorphism because lambda is eigenvector. So the kernel is it's, it's not trivial it's because we have an eigenvector, which means that F is never an isomorphism and it left the case that uh, F is equal to zero, uh, F, F minus lambda identity is equal to zero. And uh, to that end we have, um, we have F is equal to lambda times identity as well. So this corollary, we will use it later if we want to um, compute the, um, some examples in quantum mechanics. So what do we do in quantum mechanics with representation theory? So just imagine we have now, except for the Hebrew space, we also have a Hamiltonian of a system. That's just basically a linear, um, linear mapping. We can, if we live in finite dimensional space, we can just imagine the Hamiltonian to be a metric. And uh, as physicists postulate, the Hamiltonian of a system is always self-adjoint. And self-adjoint operators on hyperspace is always diagonalizable. That's a, that's a risk representation theory we have in functional analysis. So if we assume this hyperspace has certain symmetries, let's say G, and, and we know all the irreducible representation of G, and our goal is to diagonalize H. And what I want to show you guys is uh, to do that, it's very simple to use um, group representation theory. And, um, and I might as well just jump to the concrete examples. I don't want to bore you guys with uh, lambdas. Yes, let's just take, uh, take a look at these examples. I, I talked to you guys about this uh, about this conversation I had, had with this chemistry student at the party. And uh, let's just look at uh, this chemical molecule. It's called uh, ammonia, which basically uh, consists of, uh, what's N again? Um, neutron? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> And uh, H is a uh, he hydrogen, right? And uh, I would just call them N and H. And if we take a look at this molecule, and then it's it's clear to us that it has this S3 symmetry because um, this N is a little bit bigger than H, and you know it's a little bit heavier. And uh, <laughs> and sorry about my non-chemistry language here. And uh, but if we have this molecule over here, we can just permute the A the H, we can just imagine them to be um, a triangle. We can just permute the H and uh, NH3 has an S3 symmetry. That's clear. So we can just say, okay, let our hyperspace to be the coordinates of uh, hydrogen atoms, fancy H. And uh, the coordinates of each hydrogen atom is given by three numbers, X, Y, Z, right? So the whole Haber space has nine dimensions. So we can just say it's C to the power of nine. And uh, the representation of S3 into the, the space C to the power of nine, we, can, we don't know, we actually know how it looks like because it just permutes the, the H, but we can more easily, we can compute the trace. So I, I will walk, you through the examples of the trace. So the trace of the identity element, it's gonna be nine. Why is that? 
we have uh, the coordinate of um, the hydrogen atom, which is basically the first block, second block, and third block, three blocks co corresponding to the three atoms. And if we just use the identity, they stay the same. So on the block, we have one, 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 nine times one. So the trace is going to be nine. And uh, what's what about the trace of uh, the element one, two? So basically, we'll permute the first block and the second block. What we do is we take the first diagonal block and map it to the second block on the second line. So basically, we don't have fixed point anymore in the first block on the diagonal. The trace is zero. And the same applies for the second block because the second block is permute to the first block as a linear transformation. So what, what's left in variant, yeah. it's the third block. And the third block has the trace three. And we do the same for one, two, three. One, two, three left no hydrogen atom uh, uh, invariant. So as a result, we have the trace zero. So we have trace nine, three, zero. And what we can do is we embed this nine, three, zero, this, this chi over here into our character table. And we want to decompose our, um, we want to decompose our representation into sub-representation of one, two, three that we already know. And uh, like I said, the formula we uh, kind of proved before is that the coefficient is given by the scalar product of uh, the character of our representation and each irreducible representation. So the first coefficient is going to be three because what we do is we do this line nine, three, two, scalar product with one, 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 weighted by the size of contingency class. So basically we have nine plus three plus, uh, plus three times three. So basically nine plus nine plus zero. So it's gonna be 18. And then we have to divide it. Oh, I forgot to write uh, here. We have to divide it by the cardinality of group. Um, so it's gonna be 18 divided by six. And then we have three. And then if we do the scalar product with the second one, we have nine minus nine plus a plus zero. So we got zero. So we don't have a sub-representation, which is key two. And then we do it with the third one, it's gonna be 18 plus zero plus zero divided by six is gonna give us three as well. So what we're saying is that we decompose the whole space H, the Hebrew space C to the power of nine into three times the first vector space, which is C, and three times uh, the second, uh, the third vector space. And what, what, we, what we have for the Hamiltonian is that since the Hamiltonian commutes with the representation, why is that? Because just imagine if, just imagine rotation, if we rotate some, some molecule and then do the Hamiltonian, which is like a linear effect, uh, it should be the same if we do the Hamiltonian first and then rotate. The result should be the same, right? That's uh, a postulate in, uh, in quantum mechanics as well. It doesn't hold in, in, in quantum field theory anymore, but uh, uh, the, the Hamiltonian should should um, should commute with the symmetry. Should co should commute with the symmetry. And as a fact, we have the Schwarz lemma. It tells us if um, a linear mapping commutes with a, with a symmetry, with a representation, we can write it as an identity. So what we have is uh, instead of writing a nine times nine uh, um, metric, we have uh, we have um, the metric um, identity of V one that's that comes from uh, the Schwarz lemma tensor with um, a matrix M one. And M1 is three by three because we have this, this multiplicity of three. And we also have the same for identity of V3 times M3. So, so what's that? We can write it down. That's basically just a diagonal of M1 and that's basically a diagonal of M3. And now it's, it's easier to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Even though we don't know the Hamiltonian, we already know before knowing the Hamiltonian that it's gonna look like this if we choose an, an obvious basis. And now instead of diagonalizing a nine by nine matrix, we only have to diagonalize two three by three matrix. And that's easy because we know how to do that. So that's basically uh, one example like 
how um, representation theory helps us to solve physical chemistry plot problem as well. And I oh, always do have some time left. And uh, and there are certain other examples. And uh, this is this examples I packed in a single slide. I just tried to convey the idea of philosophy of um, of representations in quantum mechanics. And it's about the connection of representation theory and the spin. We know that S S O3 preserved in the product of the, of the Hebert space. So basically, if we rotate and then take the inner product, it should be the same. That's the definition of S O3. And one we one would expect since um, a space has some symmetry, then the group SO3 has to have um, a representation on that space and hopefully irreducible because we want to have uh, irreducible representation in every dimension so that we can describe our space. But unfortunately, that's not true because only in the dimension of 2K plus one, SO3 has, has a irreducible representation and they come from the 2K plus one dimensional representation of SU2. So basically we only have the odd dimension. What happened with even dimension? It just somehow disappeared. But it's not, it's not a problem for mathematicians because if we want to solve this incompleteness, we can just take the 2K dimensional representation of SU2, which we know, I forgot to say that in SU2 has um, representations in every dimension. And we can project it to the SO3. And why we can do that is because SU3 is actually a, a two one covering of SO2, SO3. So we know that SO3 has a funda fundamental group uh, Z2 and SU2 has, uh, is simply connected. So basically that's a universal covering of S3. And what we, what, what we can do is we just um, take the representation in even dimension of SU2 and then project it through the, um, the covering map of uh, SU2 and SO3. But that's, um, we can compute a bit and see that it actually produces a phase e to the powers, power of IT. And we call it the projective um, representation. But that's not a true representation, but that's not a big deal because um, remember what we want. We want to take the scalar product of um, two states and and if we have a phase e to the power of i t, and then take the modulo and uh, square two, actually, if we take the modulo, it's going to disappear because it's just a phase. The modulo of this phase is always going to be one, and it doesn't hurt, so to speak, our physical intuition in in the beginning. And we mathematicians or the physicists, they took the two k dimensional irreducible representation of um, of of um, s u two and uh, take this k number k over here to describe the k over two spin particles. So basically we have a very representation theoretical description of spin system if we just consider the symmetry of the Hebrew space. Great, so we still have uh, some minutes left. So I guess we can go to the second part. So basically this part is gonna be a little bit a little bit shorter because I just recall facts without proving them because it's it's rather lengthy to prove them. Um, and uh, what I did in my bachelor thesis and the project I'm working on is the unification of spin and while representations. And uh, what's, what I'm going to tell you today is a, a short introduction to spin representation and while representation and the idea of unification, like how I did it, or I at least tried to do it. The first, first of all, we would like to take a look at uh, the spin representation. Uh, what do we do with spin representation? What's that? So we, we take we take a complex vector space V together with a non-degenerate symmetric form B. For example, we can just take the inner product, but there are more um, non-degenerate symmetric form because inner product are positive definite and we just let out the positive definite part. Um, and then we define the spin group as follows. It's rather lengthy, but I'm sure you guys can follow me. So first of all, we define the Clifford algebra. The Clifford algebra is the tensor algebra. So basically we take the V and tensor algebra will be V times V times V 
multiple times. We can take V1 times V2 as well. That's basically why we do it with the tensor algebra. And then we identify V square to be uh, the value of the symmetric form of V and V. So what we have is, for example, if we take the vector, uh, if we take V to be R3, and then take the vector V to be one, zero, zero. And in the tensor algebra, we have all these vectors lining up. But what we say is we say, okay, if we have two uh, vector which are the same, for example, one, zero, zero, it's square, it should be equal to the non-degenerate symmetric form. If we take the inner product, it's gonna be one. So basically we take two similar, um, two same elements and eliminate it by a number. So that's what we're doing in this question here. And on that Clifford algebra, we can define a norm homomorphism. So basically we, we just take a, take a, and take a vector and then compute its norm, which is given by this uh, asymmetric form. And then, then we define the spin group to be the kernel of N intersects with those elements in Clifford algebra, which are generated by even elements. So basically V1, V2, they are even elements because they have two elements and V1, V2, V3, they are odd. They are not inside of spin. And as a fun fact, we have that spin, uh, spin group is an universal double covering group of SOV. So we, we saw it before we have this SO3 over there and uh, naturally spin three, spin three is isomorphic to SU2, for example. That's one of the accidental isomorphism. And, and what we do is uh, spin, now we want to, we have this group spin group and really we want to define a group representation of spin group. What, we do, what do we do? We see that, okay, uh, we first show that the Clifford algebra is actually isomorphic to a, a, ma a metric ring. And that is simple because uh, simple means that it only has one irreducible representation which is basically itself. So how would you like to represent the metric except for representing it as a metric, right? That's the intuition behind it. So the Clifford algebra only has one irreducible representation up to equivalence. And then we define the spin representation to be the unique representation of the Clifford algebra restricted to spin. And the restriction is new unique if the dimension of V is even. That's a theorem I showed in my bachelor thesis. Uh, I quoted in my bachelor thesis. Um, and, and the proof is rather dense as well. So you just have to believe me. And, uh, and the second, I would like to summarize the wide representation as well. Uh, so similarly, we take a vector space W, but instead of taking a symmetric form, we take a symplectic form and we call it S. And we can define the Heisenberg group to be the following W times K. So the direct product of these two spaces, K is just, uh, K is in this case, uh, R. So K is our field um, with a group structure. If we take the two elements, uh, the first component is just gonna be plus and second component is T1 plus T2 plus uh, the symplectic form divided by two. And we have the very famous Stone for Neumann theorem saying that if we fix a center character, meaning that if we have a representation restricted to zero times the field, the Heisenberg group has a unique representation up to uh, unitary equivalence. And that's actually a very famous result. It actually ensures that in, in quantum mechanics, we only have one representation of the position and momentum um, operators up to equivalence. So that's kind of the foundation of uh, of Schrodinger's representation in, in quantum mechanics. And now we have this theorem. We know that the Heisenberg group has, um, has, a, uh, has irreducible representation, but we want to define a representation on a symplectic group, right? So what do we do is we take the group action of uh, G in symplectic group. Remember symplectic group is just, if we have the element G and then we take, um, take the symplectic form, S A B is going to be equal to S G A and G B. So similarly to uh, S O preserve symmetric form, we have in this case uh, S P preserve or symplectic form. 
And then we consider this group action. So basically we take an element from the Heisenberg group and then just uh, take the let G act naturally on W. And we notice that if we have a representation rho, we can define a new representation, which is rho G C dot H. So basically we have the group action of H and this give us a new representation. And why is that? That's obvious because, oh, that's obvious because I, of course, uh, have a typo. And it's obvious because if we observe the action G on, uh, on the product of two Heisenberg, uh, uh, two elements from the Heisenberg group, it should be the same as G C dot action on the first element times G C dot of the second element. And the reason for that is really just because G is in symplectic group and if we look back into the group rep group structure of um, the Heisenberg group, it doesn't affect the S over here. Okay, so we do, we have, now we have another representation, but Stone for Neumann theorem says that we only, we can only have one, right? Because, uh, yeah, because it's a theorem. So these two representation we just defined, they have to be equivalent. So equivalent means that we can find, uh, we can find an M which intertwines with this true representation. So basically just, that's just like a basis uh, transformation matrix, so to speak, for the equivalency. And then by Schwarz lemma, M has to be unique up to a constant because it intertwines with uh, irreducible representation. And then we get uh, a projective representation from um, the symplectic group to um, the projective uh, general linear group of, um, of S. And why is that? That's just because M is only unique up to a constant. So we can't really define the M in a certain way, but we know that it's only unique up to a constant. What we do is we take the, we take the target group and then we can just caution out the constant, which gives us the projective group. And why actually showed in his paper in 1942 that you can lift this projective representation to a true one, and uh, but not of SP anymore, not of the symplectic group anymore, but MP, the metaplectic group. And this one is also a double cover of SP. Um, and uh, we call this representation, uh, Y representation or metaplectic representation of this group. And now we know that, now you guys know a little bit more about spin or Y representation. And uh, the idea of unification is actually quite simple. Um, we have the spin group, which is a double group of SOV. And SOV has a Lie algebra SOV. And the metaplectic group is a double cover of SPW. And SPW is a, is, has a Lie algebra SPW. And what we, do, what we do is that we want to unify these two group in a fashion that we can define a representation on the vector space H1 and H2 together. And what I did was to define, okay, what we do, we can just uh, take the product of these two group and take the direct sum of the Lie algebra and try to define a representation on the tensor space of H1 and H2. And uh, to define a representation on those spaces requires very rigorous definition and uh, a simple way to do that is to define a Lie supergroup. And to know that we, we, we need to know what's, what's a supermanifold. So we, have, we know what manifold is. Manifold is basically just uh, a space which uh, locally looks like Rn. And uh, a supermanifold, we would expect that it should be, it, it should locally look like Rn graded plus sum with Rm. So that's what super means, right? You have an even part, you have a, you have an odd part. And uh, what I did, did in my thesis if, is to show that this pair over here can be defined as a Lie supergroup because simply because this algebra here is called also symplectic super Lie algebra. It's even part is isomorphic to the Lie algebra of the product. And uh, as a final statement, this, I know there is a lot of super in here, but they are all necessary. 
So this least super group with that we defined here acts on a super vector space H1 times H2 as a super unit, unitary representation. And that's basically it, what, um, what I tried to show in my, in my bachelor thesis. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you guys have any questions?